Hello, everyone. It's a great pleasure to be able to come to you today to talk about one of the most important figures in the history of venous thrombosis, and that is Professor Virchow, Rudolf Virchow from Germany. And he lived, he, he lived in the 1800s, and what he proposed in those days is just as valid as it today as it was in those days, and we pay special homage to him on his birthday, October 13th. In light of that, I thought we should present something about Rudolf Virchow. You'll also notice the shirt I'm wearing, uh, never kill a friend, never treat a stranger. And at the end, we'll discuss the importance of that. I have nothing uh, to disclose uh, as a result of this presentation. And here is the original lecture hall in the Hotel Charité, which is a, a hospital Charité in East Germany, uh, in uh, Berlin, three blocks from the original cabaret. And this building has only partially been restored. The full uh, uh, picture in, in the inset shows <clears throat> Virchow's lecture hall, as it was in those days. And in 1856, Virchow postulated and showed evidence that the three factors that were associated with uh, a venous thrombosis were vessel wall injury, hypercoagulability, and venous stasis. And what he also showed was that when one was present, there was a low likelihood of thrombosis. Two were present, a higher incidence of thrombosis. But when all three were present, the incidence of thrombosis was thought to be very high. So therefore, uh, it's important that we take a look at some really uh, clinical applications of this. And what I'd like to share with you is the surgical procedures and what goes on during surgery, and how all elements of Virchow's triad are present during surgical procedures. The effects of anesthesia are responsible for a lot of this, uh, because to give an anesthetic, you usually have to give a muscle uh, relaxant a paralysis in order to intubate the patient and apply various gases and so forth. And as a result of that, the patient's lying there, so the, the blood's not moving out of the leg. In addition to that, the muscles are paralyzed, so the muscle tone helps to keep the veins in check. And when the muscle tone is lost, the veins are able to dilate. Now, remember, at the same time, the arteries are pumping blood into the leg continuously. So this finally becomes in a very overstuffed condition. And we can term that venous stasis where there's puddling of the blood in the leg due to these factors. And then that fills the veins up and up and up. And you know how that works because if you hang your ha hand over down at your side, you'll see how the veins in your hand expand. Well, imagine if that's going on continuously, arteries pumping in more blood, blood not getting out. So finally the walls crack. And then when those walls crack, uh, that can, I'll show you in a minute how exposing the subendothelial collagen to the blood triggers clotting. And then hypercoagulability is present. First of all, all the waste products from the muscles, they're sitting in this puddle. They're not getting pumped out. Secondly, the fact that the patient is having surgery in the first place is a stress which increases blood coagulation. And then are they having surgery for cancer and infection and so forth? Those are all risk factors for, for increasing coagulability. And the time of anesthesia intensifies these effects. The use of these pneumatic compression devices that squeeze the legs are critical during an operative procedure because they can minimize but not reverse all of these changes. Here we see a million power micrograph of a capillary during a medical experiment conducted by Dr. Tony Camerata, a famous vascular surgeon. And as I stated, as the blood flow slows, the veins expand overfilling with blood and endothelium cracks. You can see the cracks here in the lining and that exposes subendothelial collagen and then clots can form as we can see here in those, in, in those open spaces where the subendothelial collagen is exposed. Now, the next picture is gonna show you what happens to the white cells when the blood flow slows down. 
they change into adhesion molecules. See how the, the, the picture darkens? And these adhesion molecules now land on the surface of the capillary endothelium. And that's where oxygen and nutrients and waste products are all exchanged. And then finally, the, the, the uh, adhesion molecule will stop. An inflammatory reaction occurs. Granules are extruded, and that ruins the wall uh, of the capillary. And now the capillary can no longer function transferring nutrients and uh, 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 oxygen and so forth. And here's the real picture of the experiment. And you can see this uh, endothelial uh, cell, uh, This the white cell changed into an adhesion molecule that's penetrating the wall of the capillary. Another phenomenon occurs when the leg is straightened. And in this picture, the leg is now straightened and then it's bent slightly. And this is an ultrasound picture. And what it shows us is that when the leg is in full extension, what happens is that the popliteal vein, the main vein draining all the blood from the deep veins of the leg can be compressed by the head of the gastric nemus muscle, the big muscle there. Uh, it, it, and it, it happens frequently, but not always. And when that happens, then the blood flow has to go around through the surface veins to get out of the leg. And this, for example, you're, you're all pretty, pretty familiar with this because you know that as guards are standing at attention, they're urged not to lock their knees for fear that they'll faint. And that's part of this uh, procedure. But this is why that it's important to put a, put a, 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 a towel roll or a, a pillow underneath the knees to keep them slightly flexed when the patient is lying down. So in summary, minor operations may be major from the thrombosis standpoint. For example, you have a patient that has a minor procedure, repair of a, a fracture of an ankle as an outpatient. But if that patient is bringing baggage to that operation, such as past history of thrombosis, inflammatory bowel disease, cancer, uh, another infection, uh, or has had a past history of a blood clot, all of those factors or baggage make this low-risk procedure done in an outpatient surgery center and sent home afterwards a very high-risk situation. You must really be careful about that. Those procedures requiring over 45 minutes of general or regional, regional anesthesia are considered major from the thrombosis standpoint because it gives time for all of Virchow's factors to become activated, stasis, vascular damage, and hypercoagulability. The longer the procedure, the greater the risk. Pneumatic compression devices on the legs or feet help minimize the effects of anesthesia and represent the standard of care during surgical procedures. Furthermore, a pillow under the knees is always done to help avoid the straight leg position that can decrease blood flow out of the calf. Now, all elements of Virchow's triad are present during some additional comp, uh, common conditions. If you're, if you're non-weight bearing, there's some good duplex scan data to demonstrate that the blood flow in the legs does not increase over sitting down if you're not weight bearing. And even flexing the ankle or flexing the hip doesn't change that phenomenon. The blood is still stagnant and the Virchow's triad can, can occur. Another condition that can happen is that if the patient is non-weight bearing uh, on crutches and that, say the patient's walking on crutches, well, they're still non-ambulatory because the leg that's non-weight bearing has no increase of blood flow over lying down. And because of that, remember, that if the blood isn't flowing out of the legs normally, the arteries keep pumping blood into the leg and overfilling the leg, stuffing that leg with blood. Similarly, putting the patient in a cast in the equinus position is another thing that, that, that is responsible for uh, producing all of the Virchow triad factors due to uh, the venous stasis in the calf. And I would remind everyone, going back to that popliteal entrapment syndrome, when the leg is fully extended, that if the leg is fully extended, then the popliteal vein could be uh, compromised. And if that patient is also non-weight bearing and in a cast, then that patient could be at very high risk, even though they be, might be young, might be healthy, and have only had a minor procedure to correct their problem. 
So remember World Thrombosis Day, Virchow's Triad, and there's an international movement spearheaded by the International Society of Hemostasis and Thrombosis in order to uh, attack these problems around the world. Now, let's get back to the T-shirt. Never treat a stranger, never kill a friend. Well, it's very important that when you meet somebody you prefer, and you're going to operate on them, or you're going to take care of them, that you fully interrogate them. So by interrogating them fully, you know a lot about them like you would about your friend. And of course, once you know that about them, you would never, ever not treat them appropriately. So you'd never kill a friend and you'd never treat a stranger. Did your doctor ask all the questions about obstetrical problems, about family history of thrombosis, and the other major factors that could cause a venous thrombosis? So I'd like to thank you for watching this video. This will be presented in Endeavor Health as a part of our tribute to World, Front, World Thrombosis Day in Virchow, and also as a tribute to National Hispanic Month. So thank you very much for watching, and please visit my social media platforms for more information. Thank you very much, and have a great day.